and welcome to Rendezvous with Taj, a brand new series on ET Now. If a pantheon of unforgettable companies is ever to be made, two companies will always find their name on the pedestal. Hindustan Unilever and Indian Hotels. They have unforgettable brands. They've been relevant for the customers. They are foremost the market leaders in the categories they represent. They've created shareholder value, and there is an underlying layer of growth which is defined by a purpose. So what has made these two companies unforgettable companies? How have they managed to really survive the volatility, and they've managed to navigate the turmoil? Let's take that conversation forward with Mr. Sanjeev Mehta of HUL and Mr. Puneet Chatwal of Indian Hotels. Fantastic to have you both on this new show. Thank you very much. Oh, delighted. Absolutely delighted. The audience who look at brands like Taj, brands like Sarf, Lifebuoy, it is unimaginable to imagine that these companies and these brands, they've survived the ups and the downs and the twists and the turps and the peaks and the turps. A hotelier is sitting here, but I'm going to be asking a question, which is that what is the secret sauce? Yeah, you know, essentially you're saying that how do you make a brand timeless? Yes. Yeah. I think the first most important bit is it is not just about the functionality of a product or a service that a consumer is looking at to make a brand timeless. Yeah, if it is Taj, it is not just a roof over the head. It is about the entire experience when you come into Taj. Yeah? When you look at, say, a brand like Lifebuoy that you talked about, yeah, it goes much beyond a simple hand wash. It has been in the journey of improving the hygiene of the nation. Yeah. If you look at surf that you were talking about, a uh, proposition of daag achhe hai, it manifesting in many different ways. That's what really traverses the minds of the consumers. So it is about functional superiority. It is about a deeper purpose. And it is about remaining contemporary, which makes the brand a timeless proposition. So Chatwal, Taj was a market leader is a market leader, and I'm sure it will remain a market leader. It's timeless. Why is that? You know, as, uh, <clears throat> as uh, Sanjeev just mentioned, it's not just the experience. Uh, I will add, when it comes to Taj, there are several other things that also make a difference and makes it timeless. First and foremost being the emotional connect. This hotel where we are sitting was opened in 1903. And, um, you know, it's not a monument for India, it's a monument for the world. Uh, properties like this are not made anymore. Our iconic palaces, um, experiential safaris, uh, the flag flying high behind Buckingham Palace, in Buckingham Gate, hotel overlooking the Central Park, in New York, it's the destinations, it's the connect, it's the locations, it's the consistency in service, which keeps getting upgraded and stays in tune with time, the quality of offerings, and the right purpose. This hotel was turned into a hospital during the World War. This hotel was most recently hosting frontline workers, uh, quarantine uh, guests, uh, doing all kinds of service, supplying meals to the migrant laborers during the COVID. So I think it's the 120 years of doing things right, doing them consistently, and serving the purpose, maintaining the quality, and staying always ahead of the game without diluting that positioning of being the crown or the crown jewel, not just of the Tata Group, 
but of India. And what are the tough decisions you had to take because of COVID? Did the reboot happen in, uh, in the FMCG industry? You know, I think the first thing we have to uh, focus on, a company like ours, we never focus on the short term. Yeah. So we never get phased when times are tough. And uh, we would never take any decision which would look good in the short term but would not be in the interest of the company for the long term. So we were very clear, we are here for the long term. We've been in India for over 100 years, we'll be here for many more 100 years. And uh, so we did not curtail our capital investment. That continues. Yeah. So that was very important. Second is uh, we were very clear that we have to look after the interests of not just our immediate employees, but the whole ecosystem. So we had set up facilities where we could provide, help people by getting vaccinated. It's more than 300,000 people who are in our ecosystem. Then, just like he was talking about Puneet, when in the second wave, India was reeling under oxygen pressure, is uh, we looked around the globe, and thanks to Unilever efforts, we brought in two plane loads of oxygen concentrators, and we had a Project Hope where in 10 cities we launched it. Anyone needing concentrator could call up the number. Our teams would do the due diligence, drop the concentrator at their home, teach them how to use, and after they have finished using, take it back, all free of cost. We were able to save thousands of people. Now, important bit is that for a large corporation, for a successful company, you have to align yourself with the national agenda. Yeah. We have a very simple but a very profound belief that what is good for India is good for Hindustan Unilever. And that's how we traverse. Uh, Mr. Mehta, you are a market leader and you've maintained your market leadership in pretty much all the categories which you represent. But a market leader will always find a challenger. That's right. And the challenger will try to challenge the market leader and the market leader has to remain relevant. How do you manage that? Yeah. There was a detergent war a couple of years ago. There was this fear of Ayurveda coming back. But what you've done, sir, is that you've You've almost doubled your turnover. You've taken your margins to an all-time high when you go challenge in every large category. Yeah. yeah. You know, first is uh, being a lead, becoming a leader is much easier than remaining a leader. And to remain a leader, you have to be constantly in a state of paranoia. You have to be paranoid. The second important bit is, I believe, that good competitors bring out the best in Hindustan Unilever. Yeah, is they keep us on our toes and uh, allows us to blossom whenever we are under threat. And competition is also good for consumers. Yeah. But we must understand that our success is not based on obsession with the competitors, but it is based on obsession with the consumers. So long as we can delight our consumers, so long as we can meet the needs of the consumers, they will always give their loyalty to us. And that's what we focus on. Great point. Mr. Chatwal, for any company to remain in existence, the most important uh, point is relevance. Relevance, which is to identify the need of future India. So what is the need of future India when it comes to hosp hospitality, travel and tourism? Well, <clears throat> I would like to build on what uh, Sanjeev just mentioned. There are two things when he was talking, I thought to myself, uh, which are very unique about both the companies. One is, this group has Hindustan in its name, and we have India in our name. So he said what is good for India is ultimately good for, uh, for the business. And the second thing which he mentioned, 
which has been the hallmark especially of Taj is customer centricity. I mean, there is no substitute for customer centricity because these are the people who help your brands to become timeless. When I look at now your question about the future and how to stay relevant and ahead, I think we have a huge opportunity, uh, both domestic and international. Why international? Because Indian diaspora outside of India is growing at a very fast speed. I've uh, never seen so many Indians doing so well outside of India. And there are certain parts of the world where that relevance even increases. It's not now limited just to London and New York. I think uh, many, many places have become very relevant. For example, maximum Indian students in Europe used to be in UK. Today it's Germany and not many people know about it. So I think following the market trends, having the right data and taking decisions based on a balance of emotion, relevance and data helps brands to thrive uh, and not just, and not just uh, survive uh, you know, the test of time. So we are very excited in this journey and we feel that uh, g getting into tier two, tier three remote areas. This year we're going to open a hotel in Tawang in Arunachal, a Vivanta. We're opening also a Vivanta in Shillong. We have identified Northeast as one of the highest growth potential for Vivanta in ginger brands, not for Taj. And rightly so, because it'll take time for them to become mature markets. So, and it's the first mover advantage. Continuously invest in your growth, in the future of the brands, and keep taking them to the higher level. Another important thing was bringing two brands together, which are new, but could complement each other. Putting a Cumin QSR in every ginger hotel. So I think this exercise will be complete over the next two years. So there's, there's a lot of um, actions, there are a lot of initiatives, and there are a lot of innovations that need to keep happening consistently. It's not that you did something today and then you say, okay, next time we will revisit in six months. It is what Sanjeev mentioned, you're constantly on your toes and you're constantly anxious, what next, what next? and how we can improve the existing and keep stimulating the progress in all your brands and all your businesses. While planning, uh, Mr. Mehta, for the long term, you also cannot lose sight on what is short term. Of course, there is right? no long term without a short exactly. term. Exactly, which is volatility in commodity prices, increased competition, what is happening in terms of the natural curve of the demand growth. Yes. How do you balance both? That's right. You know, when you look at the current context, where you see uh, massive inflation, in many ways unprecedented. It's not one commodity, but across commodities, not focused on one nation, but across the globe. And uh, not surprisingly, as the world economy was just about coming out of COVID crisis, and then you get hit by inflation, it would have an impact on the growth rates. And we are seeing that. IMF, World Bank have halved the growth rate uh, of the world compared to the previous year. So there is going to be stress on demand. Under this scenario, there are two imperatives that we focus on. One is your consumer franchise. How do you ensure that the consumers remain within your fold and uh, ideally keep gaining your market shares? Yeah, both volume and value. So that's one imperative. The second is, how do you protect your business model? Yeah. When I say protect the business model, I'm not saying a preciseness of delivering 25% a bidder, but ensuring that your margin dilution is much less than your competitors. And it is within the range, considering the context. And in both this, over the last few quarters, you would have seen our results, you monitor our results. We are very pleased that uh, we have been able to deliver on both the imperatives. 
the reboot happened let's say four years ago when your margins which were below 20 they've gone above 20. For next couple of years is this the new normal for ritual now? Yeah in fact you, you know take a step back yeah nine years back from then to now our margins have gone up by thousand bips. Yes ten percent hard for an FMCG company yeah. to do that. Over 100 bips per annum. And when I came in nine years back, we used to be dilutive to Unilever. Now we are significantly yes, yes. accretive to Unilever. Yeah, But we did not increase margins by taking the price of our goods. We have a strategic pricing. We benchmark against our competitors. But importantly, we did it by first driving productivity massively. Our cost saving agenda has been giving us the savings of anywhere in the vicinity of six to eight percent of our turnover. This is an ongoing process. That's an ongoing process. Okay. Yeah. The second is the portfolio. If we look at uh, from a price lens, a portfolio which is indexed 120 and above to the market, we are over indexed to the market. So our focus on premiumization. And the third is market development, which is creating the categories of the future. Now, all this has contributed to the margins moving up. Now, if you were to ask me, looking 10 years ahead, are we going to see a similar kind of increase? No, because we have now reached a very healthy state of margins. There will be a modest expansion of margins, but when I have the inflows, I would rather invest in growing the business, growing the categories, in developing nascent categories. That would be our focus. Yeah. So the mix of efficiencies, mix of growth with a better mix, yeah, and a modest improvement of margin, that's how a value creation model will be working. Is the demand stress over? Dem no, not yet. Yeah, and the demand stress will be over when the volume growth comes back to positive. Yeah, at a national level still, the volume growth is at a negative level. And uh, once I believe that the commodities start to taper, that is when I would sense that the volumes would move to the positive. It's already level. happened, sir. Commodities are down. It is down, but still, if you, you know, we shouldn't be taking in by with one commodity. And you need to compare against your 10 year median. Most of your commodities are still at an elevated level. The second important bit is just like there is no one to one correlation between commodity price increase and our input increase, our selling price increase. The lag effect of Yeah, this. look at the last quarter. Our net material inflation was 21%, my price growth was 12%. That's it. Similarly, yeah, when the global, say, Brent crude goes down or a palm oil goes down, it doesn't result in my books immediately where there is a pipeline. So if the trend continues, certainly in a couple of quarters, we would start seeing the tapering and then there would be a new price value equation for the consumers. And if the country keeps growing, I see no reason why the demand won't come back. That's where there's Hindustan in the name of the Absolutely. company. But I'll turn to the Indian in the company of Indian hotels now. Record profits, stock at an all-time high, demand is coming back. This is the best I've seen. But is the best yet to come? Even though this is the best, you can build on the best and make good can become very good. Yeah, I think, I think the best is yet to come because Q3, is traditionally the best quarter and uh, it's it's festive season it's new year uh, it's the time um, you know uh, wedding season a lot of uh, action happens in q3 and i don't see that changing so i would definitely like to believe the best is yet to come especially in our new businesses see taj as i said is almost 120 years old and there is a certain ceiling you reach uh, in terms of driving better margins. But the new businesses will take three to five years uh, before they stabilize and they start producing great results. 
So I would like to believe that the best is yet to come. And uh, I think very important for us was to increase the margins uh, for a very different reason. Our business is very cyclical. We cannot change the cycles. So that means the volatility will stay. But what you can do is dilute the volatility by, by going for businesses which deliver higher margin percentage so that you stay iconic, but you're also most profitable. And so when, whenever there is a bad time or there is a pandemic or there is a geopolitical tension, when your margins drop, you don't have to borrow and become again debt ridden. So I think that's a challenge the sector has faced and within the sector we have also faced. And hopefully with all the initiatives we have put in place, the next uh, bad period when it comes, because it will come, everything as we were discussing earlier that goes up also comes down, what is down also goes up, including the hotel sector, uh, that we are better positioned, we are better hedged and uh, that we are able to um, you know, build enough reserves to face the challenges of future. So you're trying to essentially migrate a hospitality stroke, a hotel industry to a consumer industry, a consumer company, by bringing the cyclicality down. Absolutely, you have to do that. I mean, it's not, there's nothing, you know, is uh, cast in stone forever. So that doesn't mean that everything that is coming from the tradition is not relevant for future. In order to maintain your heritage, in order to maintain your traditions, you have to keep investing. And in order to invest, you have to grow the businesses. In order to grow the businesses, you have to also create new businesses. So you cannot be fixated or become a mono-brand company. That, you know, that was also in discussion several years ago, seven, eight years ago, if it should be just Taj. And uh, a heterogeneous country like India, where we have 87% of our business, has different needs and wants in different corners and it is not just in our in our business model it's in our name as indian hotels it is an obligation for us to address that need final question to you mr mehta for next 5 years are you excited about hul and india's growth or are you cautiously optimistic you know let me tell you that this decade and beyond is going to be India's decade. So good to hear that. There's no question about that. Uh, when India gained independence, you know, perhaps it's good to talk about that, is we were bereft of resources. A fact you may not know that India's GDP then, at today's prices, was less than the market cap of Hindustan Unilever. Yeah? Since then, We've come a long way from the two, three percent growth. For the last three decades, we have grown at six, six and a half percent. But to realize our ambitions and potential, we have to cross the chasm between six, six and a half and the eight and a half, nine percent that we all crave for. And if you were to look at the conditions today, I don't think the conditions globally or nationally could ever have been better for India to accelerate its growth journey. So the decade belongs to Sundar Chatwal. Let's get one closing comment from you, then we'll wrap the show. On India and the, On in India? the next decade. Yeah, I, I personally believe also that the most happening place uh, has to be India, unless something happens that uh, we don't know of. Um, Look at us, we have added 110 hotels to our pipeline in the last five years and it took us, I don't know, 115 years to get to the first 110. So I think it's not that we had some secret sauce or formula, it's just because growth is happening and we are well positioned to take advantage of it. So and I think this trend is going to continue. There is lots to be done, lots will get done and all the initiatives happening are very interesting. Especially, I'm very anxious, uh, anxiously waiting, I would say, to see uh, the leadership of G20 coming to India as of December and all the plans uh, that 
are discussed in FICI or in CII or in you know various other forums in which we both participate, I think that will be a big game changer and will help position India in a very different light across the globe. And if it is good for India, it is going to be good for Hindustan Unilever and good for the Taj Group of hotels. So whether it's Indian or Hindustan, what is important here is that India or the growth trajectory of India is headed higher. So it's a great field to celebrate India's 75 years of independence, but what really matters is not the 75 years gone by, but what lies ahead. And exciting times really lies ahead for India as a country and for Indians as a community.